All right, so John chapter 2. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples, and they stayed there for a few days. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and money changers sitting there. And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, Take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. So the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days. But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them, because he knew all people, and he needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in them. Okay. So why were Jesus and his disciples at the wedding? They were invited. Right. And why was Mary at the wedding? She was invited. Yeah. Okay. So why did Mary come to Jesus with the news, they have no wine? He would fix it. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, exactly. So, how did Jesus ar- address his mother? It's one of those ones people have a problem with for some reason. Oh, kind of sharply, you know, rude, kind of. T- no, it isn't. It sounds like it to us. Okay, so he's like, "Woman, what does this have to do with me?" Because and that's the way we read it, woman. What does this have to do with me? That is just normally how people talk. That's when you do a literal translation. That's what it means. So what if it said, uh, okay. uh, where are we? Two four. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. They well, she pretty sure, much go word for word. Yeah, she didn't take any offense to it, obviously. No. <laughs> you know, so it's like, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour is not yet coming. Well, so his address, that was a common form of address. It says here, a respectful greeting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So nobody, we freak out about it just because it sounds rude to us. Mm-hmm. But remember, we can't read the way we feel about stuff into other people's culture, mm-hmm. you know, especially culture of, you know, 2,000 years ago. Mm-hmm. Like, they, they should respect women more. Yeah. The, Everybody was their the culture 2,000 years ago. But aren't things in the Bible supposed to mean the same thing then as they do now? Yes. And that's a little confusing. No, because he just called her woman, but he's not being rude. It wasn't rude to say that. But it would be rude now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and in a paraphrase, they probably change it to make it sound more like what we would say now. But we do literal translation. Like ESV is a literal translation, so it's going to translate it word for word mm-hmm. what the original has, what the Greek has. And the Greek calls this mother woman. And that's just how they talk. I mean, we do have an obligation to learn some of that stuff, you know. So, yes, 
the meaning of the text has to mean the same thing to us today as it did to them then. But that doesn't mean if something they said was a friendly greeting Excuse and to us it sounds like it's rude, Thank you. Want some means uh, we're interpreting we'll it wrong. Something about well, that. means we're interpreting it wrong. It means we need to interpret it the way they would interpret it. Okay. Yeah. So they wouldn't take offense at it, so we shouldn't take offense at it because that's the way they talk. I'm over it. We yeah. take everything right. offensively. So yeah, we do. It's ridiculous. Okay, so Jesus tells Mary, my time has not yet come. So let's look at John. You guys don't have to flip pages. If you look at John 7, 7, and 8. Can I interrupt you? Mm -hmm. You're not in the middle of reading. No. Um, the candelabras, or, you know, side candles on the altar. Yeah, they can go away. Everything. Mm -hmm. okay. Everything. Yeah, we got the special one for Friday. Oh, you have what you need for Friday. Yes. Okay. Okay, so John 7, 7, and 8 says, The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not going up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. Okay? Then John uh, seven thirty says, So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. Then John eight twenty says these words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come okay 1223 sensing a theme here yes okay so 1223 and Jesus answered them the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified right. uh, 13.1 Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come. 1632. Uh, behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. And let's do 17.1. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Okay, what do those verses tell us about Jesus' ministry? His time has not yet come. The water is turned off, the rest is up to you. Okay. The fact that his hour hasn't come yet is what, what's that? Yeah, that there will come a time, right, so we heard all these verses where his hour has not yeah, yet yeah. come. And he tells his mother here, my hour has not yet come. And then later on we hear his hour does come. So what does that tell us about Jesus' ministry? Beginning and journey process. I don't know what I'm trying to... Yeah, so there's something he, there's things he has to do. To accomplish before, before his hour, the hour is at hand, right? Okay. So the hour, what is the hour he's talking about? When he, he it's, it's cru crucified, right? Right. right. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the whole the sham trial, right? the arrest, everything, the betrayal, all of that. Okay, so that's so the, when his hour comes, then that can begin. So it's the crucifixion and not the resurrection. Is his, hour. The, is, is, which is his, his hour. hour. That's his hour. That's his hour. That's the crucifixion. The whole thing. Okay. Right. Okay. I just want to make sure. You know, we make, and don't take this the wrong way, we make a big deal about Easter. Easter's the great festival, right? Because yeah. I mean, Good Friday's depressing. Good Friday's my favorite service. I like Good Friday better than Easter. That's just me. But we love the empty tomb. Jesus is alive. You know, he comes back from the dead. Boom. Your sins were paid for when he died on the cross. Mm -hmm. Now, he beat death by coming back to life, so you don't have to be dead forever, which is also awesome. But your sins are forgiven, and you're, you no longer have to suffer eternal damnation because he died on the cross. Right? Now, it's all interconnected, and they're all, you can't take one piece without the other. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's. Equally important that he mm -hmm. died on the cross, also that he rose from the dead, but that he died on the cross. That is his hour. That is why he's here. Now, 
maybe is it that he hasn't even really like arrived yet? His hour hasn't come yet. He hasn't even started his. Is this the first sign? The first. Yeah, this John will say this is the first sign that okay. he did at Cana and Galilee, and it wasn't mm -hmm. his planning because no, he, he had to no intention to do that, right? Yeah. Or so did, that's or, why or he did he. Right. Or is that why? He, but, okay. Uh, yeah. So his hour is not yet come. So every time. You'll notice the crowds, if you read the Gospels, you'll see every time Jesus does something, the crowds you know, want to make him king, want to not let him ever go anywhere and do anything because they want him to stay there and keep healing, keep making you know, bread and fish, keep doing all that cool stuff and not let him get on with what he has to do. Mm -hmm. And then the Jews, in scare quotes, capital J, you know, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin, the ruling council, every time Jesus does something, they want to kill him. It's like, we want to kill him, but we're afraid of all those people. And, you know, Jesus slips away because his hour has not yet come. When the hour comes, Jesus won't slip away. He will stand there and he will let them arrest him, right? That's what happens, yeah. what we heard this right. morning. Yeah. So when his hour comes, Jesus sits there. Well, what do you have to say for yourself? Mm -hmm. You're the king of Jews? Yeah, you said it. Mm -hmm. And then, oh, well, we'll go to Pilate. Well, all the things he admitted over here, he doesn't admit to him. He stays silent. Mm -hmm. See how he did that? Mm -hmm. Right? So he's just, okay, so I'm allowing myself, I'm allowing, he's in control. Yeah, he knows every time. Mm -hmm. He is in control of what's happening. When his hour comes, that's when he does it. So kind of going off that, I've always wondered, what happened to Barabbas after that? Do we hear anything more about him? Nope. Hmm. Not, like, Not that it was a big deal. I just wondered if they realized that they shouldn't have done what they did. Outside of... Oh, they did realize. I know that. But yeah, I, yeah well, they, I mean, did he go off and, like... He probably went back to doing what he was doing, which was being terrorist. an insurrection, insurrectionist. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, I mean, then they had... You know, he wasn't the only one. I mean, he was probably the ring, the ringleader, we mm -hmm. think, maybe, but we're not sure. Uh, but there were others. You know, there was, like, like any insurrection, their cells. Yeah. Right? Uh, and then... You know, and there's also false messiahs running around. You know, like Jesus was the only one, wasn't the only one that said he was the Christ. He just mm -hmm. happened to actually be the Christ. Mm -hmm. But you had false ones running around. I'm, I'm the Christ, right? That right. that was a thing back then, and they had them. Hmm. All right. So Jesus asks, what does this have to do with me? Is that a question? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. why does Jesus ask her, what does this have to do with me? Because the wine's gone? Mm -hmm. Because she wanted she, him to fix it. And continue the celebration. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, but it's like, hey, don't forget, you're, you, can you do something about this? Because you're, hmm? All right? It's like, <laughs> is that appropriate? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, should Mary have been asking him that? Like, yeah. oh, they're out of wine. Jesus, would you magic us more wine? Is that basically what she's doing? Yes. It seems that way, yeah. Yeah, it does. But then she just kind of, later on, she says, do whatever he tells you. Mm -hmm. So she kind of... She knows he's going to He's do going it. to. Yeah. Right. All right, so Mary is supposed to be a model of our faith in Christ. I don't think that goes far enough with this story, because, okay, yeah, she's a model of faith, but... It's really not appropriate for her to be asking him to turn to do something about the wine situation. It's not as he's a guest. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, on the other hand, are they friends of the family or very close or possibly distant relations to the family of the wedding feast? Maybe, probably, in fact. Uh, now, when you run out of wine, anybody know how Jewish weddings went in the first century? Like what they week. Did? Yeah, or longer. Yeah, so like days. Mm -hmm. the whole okay, so days. That's why when you said family, I was like, it could have been anybody in the yeah. town. So <laughs> these, these parties went on for days. So if you run out of wine. Your party's over. You're, Shame. Yeah, you will never live that down. That is like disgraceful for the host to run out of wine. Uh, so Mary's probably like embarrassed, trying to avoid embarrassment, whatever. Is that a good reason to be going to Jesus to ask him to do something about Eh. 
Okay, so her intent's not on trial, but you just gotta wonder, is it, was that really, like, is that why Jesus goes, well, what's that, what? Nobody's life was in danger or anything. Yeah, it's like, what is that? Uh, yes, but, but honor then was much more important, and like, yeah. family humiliation, it's, you know. It was everything. Family. Yeah, and it, like, it, it's not now, unless you're in the mob. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that was, that was pretty dire yeah. need in their eyes. Right, so. But don't we come to? But don't we go to Jesus for yeah. things that are petty? We do, right? I mean, sure. That's where I was. That's where I'm know, going. Yeah, even worse than that. Okay. Right. So, yeah, are we any different? No. Right. All right. So we're kind of like Mary. Yeah. Whether it's a, whether it's like a big deal, or something kind of dumb, maybe. Which maybe this isn't it, depending on how closely related they are. But we do the same things. Yeah. We we go to Jesus with whatever, and He expects us to. So was it a test for Mary? Was it for our benefit that he said that? You know, what has it got to do with me? He doesn't, Mary doesn't argue with him, right? What happens? So my hour is not yet come, and Jesus says that, and Mary just says, do whatever he tells you. Like that, that, it's the end of the discussion, right? Just what does this have to do with me, Mom? Do whatever he tells you. <laughs> Yeah, no matter what it is. Okay. Well, she doesn't argue with him. No, she doesn't argue with him. It's just like she does have the faith that whatever he does is going to be mm -hmm. right thing. the right thing to do. Okay, which is what we're supposed to learn from it. It's just trust. All right, so even if it doesn't, even the answer isn't what you wanted, like if Jesus hadn't turned water into wine, it still would have been the right thing to do if he had decided to do it that way. And... The idea being Mary would have accepted that. Like, whatever he says, that's what you do. Okay. So, trust, faith. All right, so what was the purpose of the six water jars? Washing. All right, purification. So, oh, yeah. rites of purification. So, we've talked about this before in our Bible study. So, a Jewish ritual washing. What is that? We call it baptism. Yeah. It's the same word, baptizo. So it just, just, just means to wash. So this is a, a bunch of jars for the purpose of ritual washing. And they hold 20 or 30 gallons of water, and there's six of them. That's a lot of water. How much washing do these people do? Mm -hmm. They wash everything. They washed everything. Okay, a ritual washing. It's not like you're Once lapping you them up with soap. Okay, you would wash something with whatever you're cleaning it with, but then you would take this water from this special jar, and that would ritually wash it. Even if it wasn't actually physically clean, you ritually washed it. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a difference. Um, all right, so he tells them, fill the jars with water. So there's got to be a meaning of using those jars, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, oh, yeah. is that, now the people are consuming it to cleanse, I don't know, drinking um, wine from it, cleanse, I don't know, maybe I'm looking into it too hard. Yeah, maybe. Right. So one way to look at it is you have this ritual washing that gets done with these water jars, and Jesus turns it into wine. Almost like the need for that ritual washing is passing away. Okay, so the need for this ritual washing is going to go away. The need for John's baptism in the Jordan is going to go away. Jesus is going to be the source of something new. So a lot of the things you see Jesus do, you see the passing of the old covenant and the introduction of the new covenant. Okay, so these six, and it is also baptism imagery, because, come on, ritual washing. Um, and so he does this first miracle, only John doesn't call it a miracle. He calls it the first of his signs. All right, so sign, wonder, signs and wonders. John will use that throughout this gospel. He will always call Jesus miracles, signs, Simeon. 
the word for sign. Um, it's just what he does. So you have the signs, of which there are seven, because there's that, you know, remember John Revelation, number seven, huh? Shows up in this gospel too. So there are the seven signs, there are seven I am statements, there's the number seven figures, uh, importantly in this gospel also. So calling the miracle a sign is because what does a sign do? It points to something. All right, it's pointing. This is this is the guy. This is the guy from whom everything is going to be fixed. Everything's going to be repaired. Everything that's broken in this world will be fixed. So now his time has come. It's coming. Because if it hasn't come yet, but now he does this, then this is the first of it, and this is the start, right? I don't know. Right. I mean, so few people saw, like Mary knew. Did the disciples know? They were, they were pretty clueless a lot of time. Maybe they didn't even notice, but the, the master of the feast knew eventually. I'm sure the servants told him. The servants saw, because they're like filled with water, now draw it out. Now it's not water anymore, it's wine. Mm -hmm. Okay? So... A few people saw, and they're going to talk. All right, and that's what happens with the miracles. Is that's where the crowds come from. They've heard about the signs. They want to see a sign of their own. In fact, we'll see that with the people in the temple here. Okay, so John says that Jesus manifested his glory. What do you think that means? showed it. He exhibited his... Okay, so he shows his divine power. Yeah. Right? So his uh, manifesting his glory. Um, he didn't want to manifest his glory, maybe necessarily. He probably knew this was, he knew this was going to happen, but this wasn't, he wasn't ready to manifest his glory. That my hour has not yet come. It's not time to let the people know who I really am yet. Well, okay, here we go. So I guess it started, right? So this is his first sign, and he will keep, continue doing those things. I mean, he knows. He, yeah. knew, he knew it was going to happen. He has perfect foreknowledge. He didn't always use his divine nature on earth. Uh, yeah, but he used some of it. I just got confused with that there. Yeah. How would he not know this was going to happen? He did not always know. He did not always use his the fullness of his divine power. Like when he was on the cross, that fully was a human, that was a man. Fully divine. Now God died on the cross. Yeah. But he did not use his divine power on the cross. Uh, yeah. So he didn't always use. And then there's, but there, you'll, you'll see things in the Gospels like uh, the Sarah, the woman with the issue of blood, and she touched the hem of his thing, and he and he turns around and says, "Who touched me?" He knew exactly who touched him. He did that for a reason, and when we get to that, we'll talk about okay. it. But, but like that was an example of him not using his divine nature. He did it like, "Who touched me?" It's, it was it was drama. Jesus did that too. Okay, what was the response of the disciples to this sign? They? What did it say? I forget. Uh, verse 11. They believed in him. They believed in him. Mm -hmm. right? And you'll hear that every time Jesus does one of these signs and then his disciples believed in him. Uh, so that this is the beginning of how do people begin to believe in Jesus? They believe Jesus because of the signs he's doing. Because someone says they're the son of God, take my word for it. Hmm. Yeah, no. Right. You know, I, we're going to see it in the next scene. All right, so the Passover, did you ever notice a lot of things happen around the Passover? So the Passover, the Jews was at hand. Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and there he is in the temple. What's going on in the temple? Oh, he got, I don't want to say he got mad, but. Oh, yeah, he did. Anger's not a sin. Right. So it's like, oh, well, Jesus, was he angry? Because being angry is a sin. No. Being right. angry is not righteous anger. Right. <laughs> okay, there is such a thing. You can be angry. It is not necessarily a sin. Now, can you be angry and it be a sin? Yeah, sure. Can I record okay. that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you can, you can have the emotion of 
anger without committing sin. Mm -hmm. Jesus does it right here. He's not happy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's angry. Yeah, this is what you call righteous anger because he's, they're doing stuff he does not like. It's just wrong. It's not a matter of he likes it. You know it's wrong. All right, so let's talk about what they're doing. So he found they're selling ox and oxen and sheep and pigeons. And the money changers are there. And what, what, why would they have these animals? Do you, know, you know what the animals are for? Sacrifice. Okay, well, why can't you bring an animal from home? Because it's not uh, cleansed or pure. Or, uh, yeah, so guess what? Blessed. So there's a few things you have to do when you go to the temple. Mm -hmm. First off, if you bring your filthy animal from home, the priests, you know, they leave it, they have to inspect it, and they're like, it has to be without spot or blemish. Mm -hmm. That's what the law says. So they're going to be like, yeah, there's a spot. You can't use this one. But I have these for sale over here at an exorbitant price, yeah. right? And then, oh, well, this is the temple. You can't use filthy Roman money in the temple. You have to exchange your Roman money for temple money. So making which a place of receipt. Which, of course, there's it's an exchange. Scam. Yeah, it's a scam. There's yeah. an exchange wow. rate, and they're they're extorting. So they're making money. That's what Jesus is actually upset about. Thank you. you know, it's not the they have sold animals there from time immemorial, you know. It's like, okay, you have to inspect the animals. These animals are pre-inspected, 100% certified, spot and blemish free, right? So fine, sell it to the people at a fair price. Don't, don't, they're coming here to offer the sacrifice for their sins. Don't extort them for it, which is also how these people eat, right? That's how yeah. the priests eat. That's where their food comes from, from these sacrifices. So you're getting almost paid twice. They're double dipping, kind of, in a way. Uh, that's what he's upset about. It's like, well, you've, you've, turned, you've turned his father's house into a house of usury more than anything. All right, and then what did they ask? Like, oh, well, what authority do you have to do this stuff? What do they, what do they say? What did I say? So, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Like, okay, you have a, you say you have authority to do these things. What sign will you do to do these things? Just like the sign he did. This is the first sign he did turning the water into wine, and his disciples believed in him. And now the Jews ask for a sign. By what sign are you doing these things? And Jesus doesn't do a miracle. Huh? Right? So here, he does a miracle, and people believe in him. These people say, well, what sign are you doing things? I'm not showing you a sign, because <laughs> you ought to know. And you'll see that again and again, talking to the Pharisees and the scribes of this ruling party, is you have the prophets. The prophets tell you who I am. You should figure it out, because you great scholars of the law, you should know this stuff. So I'm not doing a sign for you. You, you should know who I am. That's why he does these things. And he's like, of course, making them absolutely irate and they want to kill him, which is also all part of the plan, right? Okay, so he doesn't do anything. He just tells them, destroy this temple and in three days I will rebuild it. And they're like, huh? Because they always take Jesus super literal. You know, this temple took you know, decades to build, but he's talking about himself. Right. And notice all of a sudden, like, did you catch that in the Passion reading? It's like, well, he said he could tear down the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. That was at the trial. Mm -hmm. They were literally talking about him literally tearing down a building and rebuilding it. But after he was dead and in the tomb, they also said, hey, Pilate, you know, he said in three days he'd come back from the dead. They understood what he said, right? Because all of a sudden, so, well, he said he was going to come back again in three days, so we should seal the tomb. So they understood what he meant, right? Did you catch that? Uh-huh. Right. Okay, do you guys know what all those different feasts? We'll, we'll skip a little bit. I'm going to talk about the... we talk about the feasts today. We should save that for next week. How long have we been going? We haven't been going that much. All right, let's talk about feasts. We'll take a sidetrack. 
Jewish feasts and festivals, the three great pilgrimage feasts. All right? You have Passover, you have Pentecost, and you have the third one I can never remember. Yeah, the Feast of Booths. Okay, so you have Pentecost, Passover, and the, the Feast of Tabernacles. All right, so Passover, we get Passover, right? So Passover goes back to the Exodus when the when the, the tenth plague of Egypt, the angel of death is going to come and kill the firstborn in every house unless you put blood lamb's blood on the lintels and on the mantle of the door. All right, so every year the people remember that by reenacting it. They have unleavened bread because the people couldn't raise dough for bread because they had to leave so soon, right? Uh, so all, all the different things they did for that seven days. Uh, I will put the whole written spiel on the blog under Bible study. I'll put, I'll put the article one day for the feasts, and then I'll, we're going to talk about the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, the scribes, all those people, and I'll also stick little articles on the blog for that. Uh, so this is one of the pilgrimage feasts. It's like you're supposed to go to Jerusalem for the Passover, you know, as often as you can. Everyone? Everyone, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's basically, Passover is the beginning of the church year for them. It's the beginning of the Jewish year. So the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, they call it sometimes, the Feast of the Passover. And they have done that for 3,500 years by this point, right? It's a long time that they've been doing it. Thank God we're after. Hmm? Thank, thank God we're after. Yeah. I want some matzo ball soup. <laughs> matzo ball soup is good. Let's see. Okay, so... Yeah. Okay. So you can also look in like the, the Passover service. Um, I mean, if you ever if you ever get invited to a Jewish person's home for the Passover, do it strictly for the experience to, to see what Passover's like is is worth doing. I think I watched it online once. It's very cool. Yeah, and, but uh, where they if you ever are invited to a church where they do it in the sanctuary, Christians reenact the the. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't encourage that. It's a bad practice. We're not Jewish. Um, they said if they do it separate and they do it in the sanctuary because it's the only place they have to do it, okay. But if they're doing it as part of a worship service, don't do that. That's not good. Uh, but you can look at in Exodus 12, you know, and it shows you all the different foods that they had to eat. So you had to have lamb, you had to have the matzah, right, the unleavened bread, bitter herbs, uh, which in Hebrew is meror. It's like one of the three Hebrew words I know. Um, roasted with fire. Don't break the bones. Um, unleavened bread is a herb. I'm sorry. Raised bread is a symbol of sin because yeast is a symbol of sourness. I guess that depicts sinfulness. So matzah was eaten, one, because they had to leave so quickly they couldn't have time for dough to raise, but also because matzah symbolizes uh, the purity of the sacrifice. So again, this young lamb without blemish, um, also the matzah, which symbolizes purity, and then <coughs> the bitter herbs are eaten to uh, be a reminder of the suffering of the lamb for the sacrifice. <coughs> A few centuries before Jesus, the traditional Passover service, the Seder, started to take shape. So this didn't take shape overnight. You know, it takes centuries for this stuff to develop. So this is what the people did. Uh, and then it became the ceremony a few hundred years before Jesus. And it has, you know, a whole order. You know, the man of the house leads it, and there's a whole order what you do when you drink wine, what it means. Uh, and you learn it every year to do it. Uh, and pretty much the way they do it today is the way they would have done it in Jesus' time. It really hasn't changed. Okay, so... Yeah, that's about all we need to know about that for today.
And then you also have the Feast of Pentecost. So we abducted that word Pentecost for our the day because it's 50 days, 50, yeah, 50 days after Easter. All right, so the day of Pentecost, well, the, the Festival of Weeks, or it is called Harvest Festival. It's also called Shavuot. Shavuot. Uh, it's also called the Day of First Fruits, uh, or Pentecost. It's all the same festival. Uh, and that was also uh, dictated uh, in the law, you know, in the, in the first the books of Moses. And it's a symbolic festival which pointed to the coming of the Holy Spirit to the Jews. So, so let's see. The, yeah, it was a, a harvest celebration. Uh, the festival of weeks was used to describe the time period from the grain harvest to the barley harvest to the wheat harvest. So you had these different weeks when these things were, were uh, harvested. And God specifically told the sons of Jacob all right, that they were to count seven sevens of weeks from uh, first fruits and then on a one plus one additional day, and that gets you to 50 days. And then that exactly is the day they celebrate it. So that's the day of Pentecost, which just means 50th. That's all that number means. Word seven means. sevens is 49. Yeah, plus one day. Plus one. Gives you 50. And then they baked like these special loaves of bread. It was called a wave offering. So it's a wave offering where you take the loaves of bread and you wave them. <laughs> Literally wave them over the people. It's a wave offering. That's weird. I know. Uh, and then finally, the festival of booths, the tabernacles, which reminds them of when the children of Israel had to live in tents, right? And when they're wandering in the wilderness. So there's three pilgrimage festivals that they're supposed to go to Jerusalem to do. Uh, so Passover being the first one, which we'll hear about. But then you'll hear festival of booths, uh, festival of weeks. Uh, so when John mentions those, you will recall. That's why is Jesus in Jerusalem? Because you're supposed to go to Jerusalem for these festivals. Otherwise, he stays out. <laughs> he stays out of there, right? Well, when he was in the temple teaching, when he was 13 or whatever, is it, was, were they there for Passover? Yep. His family I'm pretty sure that was, yeah, there? Yeah, that, that was Passover. Yeah. And when he was born in the manger, wasn't that Passover when they went? Or did they, was that or was that? That was, no, that was the census, right? So oh, yeah, yeah. They, right, yeah they had to go, right, they had right. to, go to the city of their ancestor for the census. Right. Um, okay. But was it, was it Passover? I got to look at Sloop. I'm, pr I'm pretty sure it was Passover, but I don't remember. Do, Do most religions in the world have some sort of. The Feast of the Pass was Passover. It was? Yeah, it was Passover. Out. The census? No, it was Passover for when he was in the temple. When he was in the temple, yeah, I knew that. I, I was sure. No, when he was born, that was for the census. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. Do most religions have some sort of like where you have to travel somewhere? Um, well, that's like that's one of the big. That's a, one of the five pillars of Islam. I know. Okay, so, so you. So that's the Hajj. Of, you're right. Exactly. Right. So if you make the Hajj, because every adult male Muslim is supposed to supposed to make the Hajj once in his life if he is monetarily able. Mm -hmm. So if you're like dirt poor, you don't have to do it. Mm -hmm. But if you can possibly do it, you need to go to you need to go to Mecca once. Uh, and if you do that, you are allowed to use the name Haji, which is why people facetiously call Muslims Hajis. But you're allowed to use the word the, the uh, suffix Haji on your name if you've made the Hajj. Oh. Yeah, so that's one of the five things you have to do to be saved in Islam, mm -hmm. because everything in Islam is all about what you do. Well, yeah. yeah so it's uh, giving to the poor, tithing, the Hajj, praying toward Mecca five times a day, mm -hmm. and the fifth one I can never remember. Tithing, giving to the poor, Hajj, praying. 
probably something obvious. I can never remember the fifth one. She's on it. She's on it. <laughs> oh, the taking the oath, right? I forgot there's a name for it, but you have when you know it's when you say uh, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. I'm now a Muslim, by the way, because I said that. Yes. That's, that's one of the, that's a Yeah, so if you say that you're a Muslim. Hmm. There's a name for it. I can't remember the this says Shahada, profession of faith. That's it. Okay. Prayer. Yep. Alms. Yep. Fasting. Fasting. That's the other one. And pilgrimage. And pilgrimage, right. Yeah, Ramadan. That's right. Ramadan. Which is right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As you know, it's Ramadan and uh, Passover is now too. Mm -hmm. Right? They're all kind of the same. So, yeah. So, yeah, there is that kind of pilgrimage. And then there, you know, like all cultures have a rite of passage, which also can be kind of thought of as pilgrimage. So you have a lot of cultures, you know, if you want to be a man, you have to like, you know, on Native Americans have vision quests, you have to go into the wilderness and you'll have a vision. Mm -hmm. And then that's part of your coming of age thing. It also helps if you take psychoactives and do that. But go do that. Mm -hmm. uh, many of the like South American Native cultures also have things of that nature. Uh, a lot of Eastern religions have that. Yeah. Between between vision quests, pilgrimages to holy places, uh, even Christianity. I mean, uh, the, the Roman Catholic Church did it for centuries. I think they still may do it to a certain extent. But making a pilgrimage to Rome so that you can venerate the sacred relics in the Vatican, mm -hmm. you, know, you get all your different years off of purgatory for that. You know, just saying, they still do it. Mm -hmm. uh, go hear a mass at St. Peter's and you get, you know, 100 years of or whatever it is. I'll have to find you again. There's a website out there that has, like, the list of all the different things you can do and how much time off purgatory you get. There is a some, list? Yeah, because somebody yeah. put it all together. And it's, but you can, you can check it out. It's absurd. Well, like when a new pope, when a new pope is appointed, and he first comes out on the balcony at St. Peter's and does the, mm -hmm. right? You, to this day, get a plenary indulgence. If you watch it on TV, if you watch him on TV come out and do the wave, you get a plenary indulgence. All your sins canceled. Get out of purgatory free. If you died right then, you will go straight to heaven, no purgatory. So, yeah, so lots mm -hmm. of religions have pilgrimages and different whatnot. <clears throat> I knew I had to rant about the Catholic Church at some point today. <laughs> I appreciate it. They can yes. alter that list, correct? Oh, at any time. Okay, because now it says if you follow the Pope on Twitter, you get time off. I forgot. I forgot about the. Nice. I forgot about the tweeting indulgence. Wow. Yeah, that's a thing. And the, yet, I I talked to Catholics today, and they're like, you know, you guys still have indulgences, and they're like, no, we don't. It's like they haven't had that for hundreds of years, like. Well, you're not very Catholic, because yeah, they do. They mm. they really do. They still have this stuff. It's crazy, but whatever. But it seems like every culture has either a coming of age, because it's usually the the male has to do the thing, uh, have some kind of coming of age or pilgrimage to a holy site. That just is a cultural thing. It seems like. Mm. Yeah. But now in, you know, in Judaism, you know, it was a requirement. It's part of the law. You have to do it. Mm -hmm. Now when Jesus came, it did away with the It's part of the ceremonial law. So once Jesus came, the ceremonial law goes away. So no more observing the Passover, no more keeping kosher, no more circumcision, no more lots of stuff. So, all right, so the... So Jesus is upset because they're using the temple for usury is the big deal. Not necessarily because they're selling animals. Now keep in mind, it's not like the animals' cages are right up next to the altar. Okay, let's get a good picture of what this looks like. The temple grounds. Who brought the atlas today? Somewhere in here. I don't know what page they have. The... 
I thought it was because they were like commercializing. The because they commercialize yeah. it, because they're making a profit. Yeah. Right. And not just making right. a profit, like making a, like a, a killing. Right. Right. Take um, advantage. Why are none of my maps and charts in here? Or am I just skipping pages? Oh, good. There's maps and charts. I must have all pages sticking together. Oh, there we go. All right, so here's a small picture of a temple. All right, so this is Jerusalem. All right, so this is Jerusalem. All right, now here is the temple grounds. All right, so you have the porch, the court of the Gentiles. So this is where when we were talking about Jewish converts mm -hmm. to or foreign converts to Judaism. You don't become a Jew, you become a God fearer. And so the God fearers, they were Gentiles who worshiped the one true God. They were allowed in the court of the Gentiles. So then you have the temple proper. And in the temple, you have the court of the women, the court of the men, and then you have the altar. The inner court where the Holy of Holies is, like only the priests could go in there. Right, here's the altar which outside, that's where the burnt offerings are done. That's there. You know, so we're talking about like the porch. Right? Maybe court of the Gentiles. Maybe they, they made it up that far. You got the beautiful gate. Uh, we're thinking out here on one of these courts. You know, it's not like they're right up tight next to the altar in the most holy place mm -hmm. and they've got like pigeon cages stacked up. Not like that. Right. Because uh, this, this thing's huge. You know, that's really, well, well here's Jerusalem. Well, look how big the temple grounds are. It's a kind of a big deal. City. Yeah. It's like, a, it's almost like a little city. Okay, so the, Jesus is upset because they've turned it into a business, which, guess what? Church has always turned into a business. Look at American Christianity today. It's all about money. Mm -hmm. you know, look at these Yahoo preachers that write the same book 50 times and people keep buying it. It says the same thing and then every single one of them is wrong. Like, you know, if, you, if you want it hard enough, you know, God will give you many blessings if you just do this. Like, mm -hmm. That's not how it works, but whatever. You know, that prosperity gospel, because it sells, it's big business. Well, make, you got, what, 2,000 Christian books? Me and my theology library is about, I don't know, probably 1,400, 1,500 books, yeah. yeah. So, and there ain't no Joel Osteen in it. <laughs> <laughs> and there ain't no Wick Warren in it. So some of it's good, some of it's garbage. Oh, yeah, there's a lot of, of course, like commentaries. There's a lot of yeah. good Christian writers for the last 2,000 years, you know? Yeah. But, but the church has turned it into a business Yeah. to... Okay, why does a preacher need millions of dollars in like yachts and, and private jets and well, stuff? Well, yeah, I mean, damn yachts. I think he's doing it wrong. I mean, good for him, but he's doing something wrong. Right. right. If they get that, I'm not jealous, but maybe a tiny bit. But you shouldn't be, because they are really, doing it wrong. Yeah, because it's all for him. It's not really. Jesus said, you know, sell everything you have and follow me, not right. get rich now. It's sort of like, what are you putting on the pedestal? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's your worship of money. Money right. is your God. Right. But that's, that's what Jesus is upset about with the selling the animals. Yeah. Not because they're selling animals, because people, what are you going to do? You're going to travel from like Syria to Jerusalem for Passover, and you're going to drag a cow with you and feed for it? Or are you going to go to Jerusalem and you buy a cow yeah. or buy a sheep? Buy, you sacrifice a bird. Yeah, you know, or if you're poor, you sacrifice a bird. You know, they even had rules chicken. for that. Yeah. But, but are you going to drag an offering a sacrificial animal all the way from home if you're going hundreds of miles? No. Of course you're not. You're going to buy it there. Yeah. So that's not the problem. The problem is the the usury and turning it into the markup. The markup. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I read one of these? Sure. Because this is absurd. Okay. Uh, this is from you know how to be a Catholic dot org. <laughs> I don't even know why that's funny to me. But, but it is. Um, if they need instructions other than the Bible, there's a problem. This is all we need. Okay, so there's, I didn't know that there was partial indulgences. Oh, yeah. And some of these have, like, really specific rules. Oh, yeah. Here, here is one that I specifically have a problem with. It says, visit a cemetery, and you can only do this between November 1st and November 8th. 
and, and, and you have to pray for the departed. And you can't pray for the, I mean, you don't, whatever. So the week after All Saints. Okay, that's when that is. and this is only applicable to people who are died, so souls in purgatory. We don't know people's hearts. We don't know where they went. Mm -hmm. You have to go to their... Well, everybody goes to purgatory. Don't forget. Everybody goes to purgatory. Oh, in the Catholic yeah. world. Yeah. And you have to pray for someone in purgatory before, between November 1st and November 8th, just once, and you'll get a partial indulgence. But how much? Mm -hmm. How many years? I want to know how many years you get. You get four million years off. Like, how long are these people in purgatory? I was going to say, I wonder how many years. I forget, yeah. I forget what it was. <laughs> I, have to I don't look. think they even know. Yeah. I have to look it up every time when Luther, you know, was at Wittenberg and they had the castle church and the castle church, the elector of Saxony had the largest collection of relics outside of the Vatican. And I forget how many, it was like 1.8 million years off purgatory if you, if you venerated all of the stuff. And there's people that like went every year. And did this. So how many years are you in purgatory for? It's a while. What's uh -huh. plenary? Plenary indulgence is everything. That's your get out of purgatory now card. Oh, well, yeah. here is all you have to do is on Good Friday, kiss a cross. Huh. Really? Kiss your cross on Friday. Kiss my cross. You're good. Okay. okay. This is... I did not know that. You want me to send you the list? Well, that's why they haven't kissed the cross right before they die. It's a get out of purgatory free card. Interesting. Wow. Whatever. I bet they have online forums and stuff and people argue about this stuff. Well, you know, that's not really true because we're. Because it's fun to argue about made up things. That's why geeks argue about comic books. Come on, that was funny. So. That's chapter two. So next week, the most famous chapter in the Bible, right? For God so loved the world. So John chapter three, Nicodemus. Nicodemus is Nicodemus is a neat character. If we would have had a sunrise service, that's what the sermon was gonna be about. Oh, I might still do, I might still do him. I haven't decided which one I'm gonna preach now. Can you post the other one online? I didn't say I'm going to still write both of them. Oh. But, but yeah. Write that. So Nicodemus next week. And then we'll have a little bit more from John the Baptist. Are you going to do Bible study on Easter Sunday? Uh, no. Because you just said next week. Which is so Easter. the week after next, because next week, this coming Sunday is Easter. I forgot already. Uh, the week after next, we'll do John chapter 3. That's where we'll stop for today.